Hi all, my name is Gay Gordon Byrne and I'm the Executive Director of the Repair Association. I'd like to welcome you to our discussion series about fixing for change. We are featuring three new books being released this month that focus on repair. A quick intro about our authors and then we'll get started. Sandra Goldmark is the author of Fixation, How to Have Stuff Without Breaking the Planet. Sandra is a theatrical designer and an associate professor in the theater department at Barnard. She's also the director of campus sustainability and climate action in Barnard. In her spare time, she also started a repair collaboration called a fix up. So for seven years, she's been working on fix up events all over New York City, where volunteers have fixed all sorts of stuff, ranging from lamps and chairs to stuffed lobsters. And I'm assured these were toys and not real lobsters and in the process, diverted tens of thousands of pounds of waste. John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight co-authored Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture. John is the driving force behind what has grown to be more than 30 repair cafes in the Hudson Valley. If you know the area, you'll know that it's pretty rural and it's not a big population center. So this is an amazing, absolutely amazing community event. John says he was able to leverage his experience in television to bring people of diverse backgrounds together in pursuit of a common goal. He has certainly done so. His sense of importance to, of repair in building community is also very compelling. Lee Vinsel and Andy Russell co-wrote The Innovation Delusion, how our obsession with the new has disrupted the work that matters most. I really get that. New is very disruptive and not always good. Lee is an assistant professor of science and technology and society at Virginia Tech. Andrew is also a professor. He's a history professor and dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at SUNY Polytechnic. They collaborated on this book to fight back against the notion that innovators are heroes of our time when much of their stuff doesn't work at all without repair and maintenance. I agree entirely with them that repairing things is heroic, not only saving the item, but fighting against entropy. Things break and we need to be able to fix them. Welcome Kyle Weens, our moderator of our panel on design, making better stuff. Kyle will be speaking with Sandra Goldmark, John Wackman and Lee Vinsel. Thanks, Gay. Uh, I am uh, so excited to be here. I have been having an absolute blast over the last few weeks. I got my hand on these books, and so I've been really enjoying reading them. Uh, I'm going to start with Sandra's book because uh, it's right here in front of me. Um, so th the act of writing a book is uh, you, you have to dive into a topic and, and go so far into it, and, and you end up, I, I, you can almost turn yourself into an academic, whether you were one to begin with or not, uh, by going so deep into something. But I love how you've sort of brought this back and kind of distilled it. And so I've got here on page 12, you compare having stuff uh, to Michael Pollan's uh, food uh, sort of manifesto, and you say, I propose that we adapt this wisdom for our belongings, have good stuff, not too much, mostly reclaimed. Care for it, pass it on. So Sandra, walk walk me through like how did you get to that sort of simple distillation? Because and, and that basically is the thesis for the book, right? Yeah, the whole book is organized around those five steps, um, and I guess I got there feeling like, which I think many people have had this feeling of sometimes being a little overwhelmed, right? Like you could be overwhelmed by the Legos on your kid's floor as they like drive through your flesh. You could be overwhelmed with the problem of climate change, of feeling like, what could I possibly do? And how could I, you know, it can all feel quite big. And in fact, stuff is big. It's a huge part of who we are as individuals, as a species. But I also think, and this is where I really leaned on Michael Pollan, whose work is so amazing in the area of food, he argues that there are some simple touchstones that we can hold on to as we're thinking about food. And I thought, this is great. This totally applies to stuff as well. Um, we can think about have good stuff, like where our stuff comes from, who makes it, the quality of it. Not too much. How much are we taking in? Are we bringing in like these empty stuff calories, like empty food? Um, mostly reclaimed. Care for it. That's all of us because we're all fixers. And pass it on. And so I was trying to do both. It's complex, it's big, but it's also not. Well, and, and I love how it kind of frames it. I mean, a lot of the discussion around around stuff and repair as well, well, fix things to save the planet. Well, what does that do for me? Uh, I mean, at, at an abstract level, yeah, I want to leave a legacy for my kids, but really I want to leave a healthy, wholesome, happy life. 
Uh, and so kind of by framing it around around benefits to individuals where we can so do what's best for us and then also it happens to be better for society. That's true with Michael Pollan's work and I think you lay out a pretty compelling case in your book. Uh, all right, so our next uh, panelist uh, is Lee. So Lee has uh, the, the innovation delusion and um, this is a little bit more of a historical and, and societal look at, at why uh, we spend so much time talking about new things and not talking about what is already out in the world. Uh, and at, at some level, if you think about it, like the world is big and complex already, the things that we already have, uh, you could spend a whole lifetime going through the world and learning about all the systems and places that we have. And yet the majority of news is talking about things that uh, either don't exist yet or are not broadly uh, put out there yet. Uh, and, and Lee, you spend a lot of time talking about roads. And I think roads are a wonderful sort of metaphor for everything else because I, it's interesting in my local city council, uh, like if they do all the surveys and what everybody wants, they, they keep saying we want the, the roads to be maintained better. But then when it comes time for, for policymakers to actually spend money on things like let's build a new water treatment plant, let's like start on new projects and not work on maintaining what we've already got. So what brought you to this path? And, and can you can you tell it? Explain to us why roads are such a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I really liked where Sandra started there with like connecting it to the personal because I think we're there's a kind of we're kind of have a split mindset when it comes to things like roads, right? On the one hand, we want we want good roads, and yet we don't want to pay for the the cost of them. We don't want to be taxed. Um, so I think that that you know one, a big theme of our book is just the lack of long term thinking in our culture. And there's a bunch of incentives and structures, you know, we can think like social scientists think in terms of social structures that push us towards the short term, whether it's just in terms of like consumerism and having credit cards and wanting to like buy stuff and not dealing with the costs like now, or it's on the level of government and, you know, uh, politicians being, um, you know, it's easy for them to gain credit for building new stuff, it's very hard for them to gain credit for things just going well, right? Uh, and I think if we look at organizations and other things too, we see the same kind of structures. There's a bunch of things pushing us to, to, to kind of act on the short term rather than think long term. And that there's something hardwired into how we biologically function, right? That always drives us to be looking for and talking about the new. I, I work in the world of, of technology news where we wanted to have this conversation around repair and we couldn't figure out how to have it because it wouldn't break through. There was always a new product launch. And so the only way we were able to make it work was by hijacking the product launch uh, process, right? And we do our teardowns. Well, teardowns are merely a way to game that psychology and get people thinking long term when, when something new comes out. One of the funny things, though, that we found in our shops, and I know John found this too, was that actually, like, we totally have that impulse for the shiny new. It's human, as you said, Kyle, right? We love that. How could we not? But also, we actually also have an impulse, an attachment to, the, like, the boring and the old. <laughs> and that's, as Leah is saying, that's what our society and what our structures doesn't support in any way. I also think we know it's cultural. So... And for many cultures around the world, for most of human history, actually didn't privilege the new in this way. And when we think about like short term decision making, so like, you know, putting off a pleasure now for something down the road, other cultures like like South Korea, for instance, are more likely to put off a pleasure for that down down road payment than Americans are. So, I mean, I think I don't think we want to kind of like turn it into an essence of humanness to like focus on the shiny, because I think it allows us to kind of um, just like dismiss how much of it is about kind of the way we've been reared and the, the culture we live in. Well, and so one key way that we can catalyze culture change is is by is by uh, uh, focusing on our community and the people around us. And I can I can talk on the internet all I want. It is not going to have as much of an impact as getting together in a room uh, with with people that are like minded or people that are just working on solving a, a joint problem together. So John is uh, the uh, author of. Um, uh, of the repair revolution, at where he, he lays us lays out the history and sort of the trajectory of where we've gotten with the right to repair movement, but also spends a lot of time uh, providing practical advice for people that want to run fix it clinics or repair cafes in their town. Uh, so, John, welcome. Very excited to have you. And I'd love to hear kind of your personal journey. At how did you get involved uh, with repair cafes? 
Well, you know, I, um, I grew up uh, liking to work with tools, and uh, so woodworking is my skill set. And, and so this, you know, led me to projects upon projects as, as I, you know, matured and grew through my life. But I reached a point where um, uh, the, you know, the uh, kind of the, the allure of being with people, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I would say I've been a community builder all my life. That's something that has interested me. How do you create community? And in fact, bringing people together uh, around fixing stuff has turned out to be uh, a very alluring thing. You know, there is something that is, you know, that, uh, something about troubleshooting that to many people is an irresistible proposition. And when you sit down to, you know, to take the cover off of something and get inside of something, you look at how the stitches are made, uh, how the fabric is blended. You know, these are all things that just um, drive our curiosity. It's, you know, it's this curiosity about the way things work. When you do that in a community setting, I have really come to believe that repairing in community is powerful and that a fixed thing is a beautiful thing. And that these are, you know, these impulses to repair are everywhere in our lives. They are in our, you know, in our homes, uh, they are in our communities, uh, they are in our, you know, in our larger ecological systems. So how do we get, you know, human economy to be closer to ecological economy? It is, uh, it is something that I see in the bonds that, and we call them, you know, are the folks that gather together in a community to repair stuff, they're repair coaches, because that indicates this, you know, interchange of information. You know, these repair events are not drop-offs, and that's very important to say. Right. They are, you bring your item and you sit down with the person who's going to give it their attention. And these things are, are, are just, uh, you know, you, you, every item comes with a story. Uh, every item has meaning. And so what do you do? You sit down and you tell the story. When did it stop doing Absolutely. what it's supposed to be? Well, and the, the best way to learn something is to sit down with someone and have them show you how to do it, and then you copy them, right? And that, that interchange, that interplay, of uh, right information and context that's th that so the essence of humanity I, I think that that then becomes the kernel of how we can start to bring people along this journey and so I can imagine you know, almost if you think about a sequence of like how do we go from someone who doesn't care about about this issue or or know much about stuff how do we bring them into our ecosystem I before they read any of these books I would want like go to a repair cafe bring something broken <laughs> go hang out with John uh, get get that experience and then maybe read Sandra's book where she's talking about sort of the 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 emotional connection with our objects and then as you, as you as you dive more into it and you want to like look at the macro scale of what are we doing with society that's where Lee's book I think uh, comes in very nicely so I, I want to just kind of have a bit of a personal conversation. Maybe maybe this can be a conversation. But my first question, I want to hear this from all of you, is what is the last thing that you fixed? In my basement, uh, you know, here it is. We're turning in the northeast. We're, you know, we've summer is behind us. Fall is in the, is, is here. And winter is coming on strong. So, uh, right, we, we, uh, we coil up our garden hoses and we go into the basement and we turn off the spigot that feeds the outside faucet. Well, uh, in the act of doing this, mine started to leak seriously. I mean, we're talking about a gallon a minute was starting to come, come out of that. So that was a, you know, a, a quick call to uh, the friend of mine who really knows what he's talking about. Uh, and so basically it was, what would you say, this is triage. Make, having to stop that leak and you know then it's really a matter of finding uh, you know going to the hardware store finding the part that I can use to replace it so that was you know that's home repairs so much of our repairs are at home I mean you know Lee when you when we talk about maintenance uh, that is you know this whole everything involved in home ownership and, and maintaining your home how you know, what, what section of our economy is really not 
quantitatively tracked in, in just home repairs. It's huge, yeah. Sandra, how about you? What'd you fix? I'm sitting right in front of it. So it's the table I'm at. Um, it's like a farmy, I think it's like kind of a fake farm rustic table and it had like a huge gouge in it. So every time people sitting where I'm sitting now would put their water glass down, basically it would like tip over. <laughs> it was super annoying. This like little, you know, break in the table was causing a lot of havoc. So we filled it with wood putty and sanded it. Um, it actually took forever to dry because it was a lot of wood putty. Um, and then finally it dried and this is where I got so excited because I, one of my favorite um, like things to do is paint matching and staining and color matching. It's because of my theater background. I love scenic painting, so I matched the paint. Um, a lot of people do visible mending, but I guess because, you know, again, theater is about artifice, I love a good invisible mend as well. <laughs> yeah, I have another basement story. So we have, um, when we first moved into this house, it's a log cabin up on the side of a mountain. The basement was very kind of dank and had a, you know, kind of moldy smell to it or whatever. And so we and put in one of these, you know, fairly inexpensive dehumidifiers uh, that run to the, um, to uh, the bath, the, the um, shower stall in the basement and just takes, you know, water out of the air. Well, it just kind of stopped working one day and it turned out that it was the hose was blocked up. And when it does that, it kicks over to the um, you know, to the first the bucket in it that, and then it just stops working altogether. So it was a very simple fix of just washing out the hose, but it felt rewarding. You know, I think this is something we can all relate to. I mean, when we started our community repair events, you know, I thought, well, to, to fix most things, you need a part, you know, right? Repair requires parts. But in fact, what, what I learned very soon is that when something stops working the way it should, it's because a connection has been lost. And that may be mechanical, electrical, electronic, digital, uh, and, and they have, you know, again, fabric and textiles, a connection has been lost. And the fix is, is uh, reestablishing that connection, finding it, putting it back together. And in so many cases, the fix is simply cleaning. Yeah, reestablishing yeah, the absolutely. connection is a very beautiful phrasing. and. I was I sitting like here thinking like half the time we're just taking gunk out of something. <laughs> That's not as eloquent. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you the, the opposite. So mine, there was too much connection. My, my repair last night, my, uh, my Windows laptop uh, was starting to, uh, every time it invoked the video card, it would blue screen. And I opened it up and it turned out a fan, a, a screw had come loose from the fan and was rattling around loose in the case. And so I removed the screw, put it back together, the computer works fine. So it was jumping a connection. Kyle, what year is your your laptop? Because I know like Mac laptops are so unrepairable, but I know you use like an older uh, one. Yeah, so we have an ethical standard at iFixit. You know, we have our repair score from 1 to 10. 10 is most uh, fixable. 1 is very hard to fix. We won't buy laptops for our staff that are under a 5. So uh, for Apple, the last laptop that Apple made that meets that requirement was in 2012. So I'm talking to you right now on a 2012 MacBook Pro. Uh, it's been upgraded to 16 gigs of RAM. I've got a two terabyte SSD in it. Like I've, I've upgraded, it's a great machine. It still works perfectly well. That's such a great policy. I've been trying through work to get a refurbished computer and we can't do it because of the contract we have. Do you know what I mean? Like we literally can't buy right. a refurbished computer and that's a great And these policy. are things that we're working on. We can have a whole nother conversation about, about purchasing procurement standards and <laughs> right. We spend a lot of time working on that and EPEAT is the, is the green standard for electronics purchasing. So we, we will go down that rabbit, rabbit hole over a period of the conference sometime. I wanted to, to uh, dive in a little bit more to the things that that we uh, sort of have in our homes, and one of the the challenges that I think that that most people face around repair. When I when I ask most people, when we've done surveys of the American populace, and said, "Well, you know, that last thing that broke, why didn't you fix it?" Overwhelmingly, people say, uh, and particularly women, will say, "I have no idea where to start." Um, and and one of the ideas that I have that sort of underpins this is that there is. One, we, we have embarked on this journey of specialization. Everyone in society is highly specialized, right? Uh, you're not just a lawyer, you're an intellectual property lawyer, you're a contract lawyer, right? So uh, is extreme specialization of disciplines, but that is also married with the specialization of things in our lives, right? So you look at your kitchen and you say, how many different appliances do we have? And your blender is different from your food processor, 
right? Uh, and, and so then you have the question, is the person who fixes a blender the same person that fixes a food processor, the same person that fixes a washing machine? Um, and so I'm curious so that each of your take on uh, this kind of macro trend toward many different things in our homes, many different things in our lives, where we might say, well, grandpa used to fix things, but I don't, we don't fix things anymore. Well, grandpa knew how to fix a lot fewer things than you may, but as a percentage of the things that he owned, it was much greater, right? That your John's woodworking skills went a lot farther 50 years ago than they do today. So Sandra, maybe maybe lead us off because you, you have experience in, in theater where you have so many different gizmos. How do we reconcile wanting to repair with, with sort of the, the increasing fragmentation of the number of things that we have to learn? That's a really interesting question. And I think, well, to, to the people answering your survey, I would say just try because it's already broken. You really can't go wrong. <laughs> um, and of course they're, you know, it's an interesting question of this, feel, and I think it goes to some of this question of overwhelm that people feel, just like overwhelmed by the multiplicity of stuff and the complexity of it and the feeling that they can't handle it. Um, and accidentally, one of the things that we did in our repair shops was actually address that question of specialization because even in the act of repair, of trying to find somebody to fix your whatever it is, historically it was specialized, right? There was a jeweler, a cobbler, an uh, appliance guy, um, whatever. So in our shops, we would bring all these theater people. So we were specialized. We each had our skill sets, but we were all in the same space. It's kind of like a repair cafe. And people could come in and bring almost any object. And you could literally sense the relief, the relief in them when they would come in with their like, you know, toaster and they'd look around and they'd be like, oh, you can do a lamp and a necklace and a, and a bowl as well. And they would go home and get their other stuff and bring it in a bag. And so, in a way, I wonder if it's just a question of like, I, I agree with you, I think there's like way more complexity than there needs to be. Like you really, I don't think you need a different, a separate machine to do all these different things in the kitchen. But at the same time, maybe there are some clever ways that we can structure it for people to make it easier for them and to reduce that feeling of like, I can't handle it. You know, our parallel movement in the UK is the Restart Project. And, and you know, in conversation with with them there, they are always talking about gadgets, all the gadgets. Right, right. and Restart Project is, is uh, similar to a repair cafe, but they do tend to focus more on the technology side of our lives, yeah. absolutely. Although I know that they are broadening that out. They're making a concerted uh, you know, uh, goal of broadening that out. They, they want to work with textiles, they, they really do. Right. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if I... you all know the, the um, uh, this, uh, factoid, and that is that 80% of the environmental impact of the things that we buy is determined mm -hmm. at the design stage. Mm -hmm. yep. That is, to me, an astonishing, but, but also, when you think about it, oh, it makes entirely, you know, entirely good sense. Right. Well, we're disconnected with where things come from, and that's something, that's something that I want to uh, uh, talk more about. But Lee, I'm curious your perspective on specialization. I think I'm of I'm of two minds about this. So, on the one hand, Andy and I I think kind of celebrate specialization and complexity. And so when I talk to you, Gay and Nathan, you know, like kind of reader, leaders of the right to repair movement, I often focus as much on the small business argument as like the repairing our own stuff argument. Like I would be happy to have local repair shops, right, where I could take things because realistically I don't have time to become like fix all the things in my life necessarily but th that ability to go to local repair shops i think is really important um so that's a conservative argument i like how that a i know i wrote a piece about for the american conservative on this very issue right right and on the other hand uh, you know i've talked to peter mui about like you know his philosophy on this stuff and he almost and by the way peter runs the the fix-it clinics which is a uh, mostly west coast west coast of massachusetts group of repair cafe style events yeah and i you know I, sandra like this with you know the way she writes about re religion in her book but i almost think peter like describes it like a conversion experience like he wants people to open things up because of like the aha moment they have where they realize they can do that. They're no longer alienated from their stuff to at least open it up and check it out. And I think that's really important. Like us walking around being alienated from our things is not a, not a good 
It's so uh, true. And like we're talking about design here in this conversation a little bit, but also there's just making, which isn't necessarily the same thing. And it's interesting, like we, we make so little or so, so many Americans today make so little of like what is in your home. Even us who are supposedly into repair and all this stuff, if you look around, what percentage of the things around us did we make? And so in some ways, maybe repair is a way to get you that that physical connection, that physical relationship with an object when you open it, that aha moment? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. There's been an awful lot written about, you know, the tactile experience and, mm -hmm. and how important it is to be able to work with your hands. Yeah, and Kyle, I want, you know, I, I think this fits with iFixit a lot too, you know, because I, I feel like part of the computerization of our world is our, you know, relating to like screen land or something, right? And not like not having any kind of tactile relationship with all the electronic gadgets around us. And I think that puts us in a kind of different um, relationship to things. Whereas I think you, your whole philosophy and what you've been up to for so long is like saying like, no, this is stuff too. You can get your right. fingers in there, right? Like, uh, right. you know, dive in. Um, doable. Well, and for a while there was a design trend in user interfaces called skeuomorphism where they were trying to make the interface on the device look like a physical object so you'd open iBooks and it would look like a bookshelf uh, and like all design trends it came and went <laughs> and we're on to flat design and other paradigms now uh, so you know all of this uh, of course we're, we're kind of we're all looking at this at a sort of thousand foot uh, picture but what do you think is there anything that you've seen that's inspired you uh, um, or maybe maybe an anecdote that you shared in the book about uh, a, a way that we're getting sort of mainstream people involved and caring more for their things than, than they necessarily were even a few years ago. Uh, and I, I have, I have anecdotes from your books that I can pull out, but I want, I want you to kind of share your stories. I mean, John, you're, you're closest to people in these events. Like, do you see, do you see growth? Well, Where do you see signs of One of the of things growth? that we like to highlight, uh, is, is the fact that, um, people who come to uh, our events, and, and I, you know, I should say there's nothing proprietary about getting a group of people together in a town to fix stuff. And, and, and so there are, yes, there are repair cafes, and there are fix-it clinics, and there are mended maidens. And uh, I recently became aware of a group in Chicago that is the Community Glue Workshop, and they're doing exactly the same thing. And, and yet, so what, what you do is you invite people to bring items that they care about, that have meaning to them, and, or that they simply find useful. And when they bring it in, that's, that is the common denominator. We've all got broken stuff. Uh, but in fact, what it, one of the things that it highlights is, is our commonality. And so that things that we may disagree on in another setting are are you know in the background and so what you have in front of you is the most important thing and this is a really strong way to create community uh, it's it's more effective than any other way that I have seen well and you're starting with a problem that's identified you bring the, the toaster in it doesn't work and you do work together and at the end you have clear progress right you know that you you accomplished a task and so bringing people together and like accomplishing something that is objectively good, particularly in these sort of fraught political times where we might disagree about truth from you know one side of the street to the other. Well, the toaster did not work and now it works. We all agree about that. Right. There's objectivity there at least. There's that's absolutely right. objectivity. <laughs> well, but objectivity in a social sense where we're bringing people together. So I, yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's really inspiring. To, to treat community building as a form of healing, right? Because mm -hmm. in order to bring, to, to heal and knit the divisions in society back together, we're going to have to come together as humans and reconcile our, our yeah. differences. And, and, and so providing a safe context where we can come together and work on something apolitical, uh, where we are making joint progress together uh, and, and both of us come out ahead, right? Because we've got yeah. this relationship that we've built. We've got a thing that works better. That's really exciting. Yeah, we talk about this as the signal that people receive when they walk into a repair event. And here's how we describe it. That signal says we are better off when we see our own community in the midst of cooperation, creativity, and downright decency in a place where goals are achieved and positive outcomes are realized. Yeah, that just focus on on positivity and right. We're rolling back entropy. We're doing it together. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, an initiative that we write about, um, and I I hope to write more about, 
here that um, is that has a similar vibe is the Floyd Initiative for Safe Housing. So here in like rural Virginia, um, something it's it's actually a problem everywhere, including in cities. But critical home repair is a real problem. And the definition of critical home repair is basically repairs that have to happen unless, you know, if the house is going to remain livable or apartments going to remain livable. And so because for complicated uh, regulatory and legal reasons, it's hard to get state money to do this repair work uh, in people's homes with contractors. This community group has just come together, uh, the Floyd Initiative for Safe Housing, and just like, you know, they pick projects and they just go and like get people together and they just go fix people's houses, you know? And it could be r roofs that are collapsing on people. It could be floors that are rotting out from underneath them, especially in like, uh, tr you know, um, mobile homes. So, I mean, I think that that is a kind of wonderful vibe and, and, you know, shows the kind of volunteerism that this stuff takes right now. You know, I would love I can talk about legal changes that we could, you know, <laughs> have to get to get to a better road. But for now, I mean, I think this is what it takes. Well, you think about uh, so let's say so you can go down to Home uh, Depot and you can buy a new toilet. Uh, what portion of Americans are going to install a toilet themselves? Right, it's, it's under five percent. It might be one percent. I don't know. Right, most people are going to hire a plumber. They're going to hire a contractor. Uh, and yet, uh, Home Depot is a billion-dollar corporation selling toilets to consumers in every town in America. Right. So with that this whole ecosystem. And oh, by the way, if the plumber is having trouble getting getting a part from his wholesaler, he'll go down to Home Depot and get it there. So we need an ecosystem around repair. It's not. It's not an or. It's an and. Uh, when we first started iFixit, we got some pushback from the repair shops. And uh, very quickly, they realized that they were learning as much from iFixit as they were sort of losing to DIYers going and doing it themselves. And, and uh, we, I haven't heard that, that argument in years. So, I think we, we all will say that iFixit has changed that ecosystem of repair. There's no question about it. Well, and we are trying very hard to be, you know, as comprehensive as we possibly can. By the way, something you may not know about iFixit, we have power tool repair on iFixit now. So we have added over 20,000 power tool schematics in the last few months. Uh, so the next time you're looking, I bet you'll find your, your, the part number that you need. Including chainsaws and everything? Uh, absolutely. We've got chainsaws, we've got trenchers, we've got power drills, you name it. You know, and cool. one thing that we should mention is, is tool libraries, because tool yeah. libraries are so important in this. And... And in fact, you know, from my observation, it's millennials, it's 20 somethings, 30 somethings that are starting the tool libraries. And, you know, one simple explanation is, you know, uh, it, it costs money to be able to buy this stuff and you need a bigger place to be able to store this stuff. So if you can just check it out and use it mm -hmm. for what, you know, for those few minutes you need it, that is such a benefit. And, and, and the community of those people and the learning opportunities it's all there well and the it's an efficiency argument too ultimately for me i mean so many of our tools just sit around um not being used for most of their lives right uh and you know so the, all the energy and that goes into making those tools when we could you know have central kind of repositories for them um at least the big things that we don't use very often who needs to own that shit? Nobody needs to own that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and in your book, you do a wonderful job of talking about sort of the aesthetics around uh, loaning and passing some of that on. <laughs> it's really well. Really you fun. know, libraries have been librarians have been tremendous champions of community repair because you know right. it's, it's programming that they love. It's intergenerational. It's hands-on right. learning. All the things that librarians love and. You know, there's this tremendous movement, which they they have been calling the you know 21st century libraries. And so many mm -hmm. libraries, in fact, uh, they they do. You can check out almost anything. You know, from badminton sets to um, American Girl dolls. And, well, maybe this is something that that we as a group uh, should be doing is reaching out to librarians more and, and training them because uh, absolutely, I mean, should, maybe every library in the country. Well, should they are the original circular library. economy if you think about it. Yeah. If you think about it, <laughs> right? And that, and at least in our region here in the Hudson Valley, that is happening. Yeah, and there's tool lending libraries all over the place. They're they're fantastic. They have challenges of maintenance as well. You have tools on uh, accelerated uh, duty cycles. 
uh, and and so you have to be able to have someone there that can work on them. So uh, I'm all ears. I, I want to um, shift conversation a little bit to talk about product design. Uh, first, uh, let, let's just have a little bit of fun. I want each of you to shame an object. <laughs> so, so tell me something that you've seen lately that you don't particularly like. Uh, and I will start. My least favorite object in the whole world right now is the Apple AirPods, uh, which have a uh, integrated battery and are disposable after 18 months. Uh, and I use every opportunity I possibly can to talk about how the designers who uh, created them hate you and all of the rest of us. Where, where do we start here? Uh, <laughs> So, okay, so we fixed like about 2,500 objects in our seven years of these pop-ups, and 15% of those were what we called repair fails. Of that 15%, a vast majority of the fails were due to either parts unavailable, broken plastic piece, um, or literally like impossible to open without shattering or ruining the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm going to sort of go back in my catalog while someone else... Like a Keurig is in the category of something that you can't snap open without breaking all the tabs. It's designed to snap so closed and then never open ever again. I'll pick as my favorite object or my least favorite object, one of the original iconic things that broke in my house seven years ago that we, um, we, cho we couldn't fix and uh, sort of spark the whole thing because it's a lamp. Like you think of the poor design for electronics and you think of it for things like Keurig. But this lamp, it had all of those characteristics like buried in this is seemingly innocuous object. So it has a hinge point, right? The hinge point is made of a plastic piece, which is obviously taking stress. Bad idea. Um, at that point where the hinge, so the plastic thing broke, and you can't even get the part out because it's riveted in instead of screwed. So it's just very annoying lamp. <laughs> So speaking of rivets, uh, to, to steal the mic back for a moment, we, we buy, uh, we go on, uh, when we're trying to figure out what to uh, uh, add to iFixit, we go on Amazon and we go on Walmart and we take their top 20 uh, selling lists, particularly at Christmas, but we're looking all year long. And then we buy the top 20 items and then we'll, we'll write repair manuals for them. And we do this category after category, so we'll go through and we'll pick the top 20 lamps and then we'll write repair manuals for those. The single category that completely defied us and we failed and we sent them all back was baby strollers they are all riveted together and we i don't got know some sandra if you ran and some across scooters. this there's also a lot of little plastic parts under stress in those puppies often so we just we just gave up and we said we're not going to write service manual for something where we have to drill out every single rivet and replace it with a bolt before you can do anything um so if you're if you're looking for it for an infant stroller look to see are they are they bolts or uh, are they rivets lee how about you um if you remember the Juicero, I saw there's like a new Juicero for like t cocktails now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's just shameful. You should be making your own cocktails. You're gonna get on the no DRM <laughs> bandwagon. But um, but actually, you know, um, partly inspired by conversations with you and Nathan and Gay, um, I um, I've given up Apple altogether. I I've got, until they kind of change their um, policies, I I won't. Um, I just won't buy Apple products anymore, um, just because they're so unrepairable, and it seems like such an ethos at that at that company to make kind of unrepairable stuff as well as as lockdown repair. So that's a big that, shame. That's not like one product, but <laughs> and there are exceptions. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, and the folks at Apple don't want to be perceived that way. They they, right. they are they have a lot of pride in themselves as being you know, the best product designers in the world and some of the best some systems thinking in the world. And their iPhone repair ecosystem for certain things, if you go into an Apple store, is pretty good. Yeah. Um, but uh, in many other respects, they they let us down. Right. Like, is if repairability is a factor in saying if something's well designed or not it changes the equation well if you talk with apple folks and actually i saw their response to a right to repair story yesterday they said we design it not to break oh come on but okay, that just that's a fantasy <laughs> that is a fantasy <laughs> there's this thing called entropy and uh it's real <laughs> if you want to talk about objectivity all right, so I, I want to uh, wind things up a little bit by asking a positive uh, anecdote. And maybe you could tell me about a product or a company that you think uh, is uh, has done a good job. And then maybe if there's a lesson that you could take out of that, and, and if you had a, a request to the world of product designers, what's something from an object that you've seen that you could take inspiration and say, hey, man, if every other manufacturer would do that, that would be really, really cool. Hmm. Um, and so I'll, of course, I'll start with yeah. Patagonia. Uh, 
uh, and so what, one thing that Patagonia did, they have a, a, a luggage, um, a piece of luggage, and, and it's common on luggage, the handles break. You know, you have the extended uh, uh, handle on, on roller luggage. And they said that one of their, their top managers was at an airport, and the handle stuck open, and he's, you know, the executive of Patagonia. And he had to, like, break the handle over his knee in order to get it onto the plane. And he was so ashamed at that experience that he said never again. And they redesigned it where – the, the handle is a cartridge and there are color-coded screws mm. and, and so if you call Patagonia and you need help they just send you a new handle cartridge and then your luggage is good to go so that's like thinking about that common failure point and then building a system around that is, that's an uh, amazing story we had practical. so many retractable suitcase handles that we stopped accepting we stopped because it was was, was yes. a waste of everyone's time you can't do it you can't repair them generally yeah, yeah. I, this is the only luggage I've ever seen with a repairable retractable luggage handle yeah, and the, I mean, I guess, like, there are, I think, yeah, we'd have to have a whole conversation about why there are certain markets for things that last, because uh, something that came to mind when you're saying that is I've had this um, laptop backpack since grad school. It's about 15 years old now, and it's one of the, one of the few things I've owned that's become, like, deeply unfashionable on, like, it looks like it's from 2005, but it's, like, whatever, and it just, like, I, I don't know how much longer it will last, but it it is you know it just takes a lick and it just keeps going you know and so it, it's um, yeah it's a Timbuktu backpack and it just built really really well um, so like where where those markets are and why they are is a really interesting question. Well, so I can add praise to Timbuktu. They have added repair guides for their uh, bags to I fix it. And they do repairs in San Francisco, so if you mail your repair into them, their sewers in San Francisco will fix it for you and send it back. They're a fantastic organization. That's cool. I have a good response, I think, and that is to um, honor the humble table lamp or floor lamp. So think about <laughs> this for a moment. Um, first, I will say that it, uh, we see more lamps than any other type of repair mm -hmm. by far. And, and so... Apart from, you know, a few fads with, you know, halogen uh, illumination and so forth, almost every lamp that you see, when you look at the socket, it is just about the same as the socket 15, 20, or 30 years ago. It's upgradable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what people bring at, uh, lamps that they actually have a great attachment to, again, table lamps, floor lamps, Many of them are very beautiful mm. and very unusual. They are unique in their design, and and people, you know, they really would like to keep them. They really don't want to get a replacement, but you know, they do not know where to take it. And so, lamp parts are it's the one category of parts that we actually stock. We have you know sockets, uh, of, you know, three way various kinds of sockets, switches, uh, and plugs and wire. And those, uh, those are very gratifying to fix. Now I'll tell you that every repair manual of any description that has been published in the last hundred plus years has very simple instructions on how to rewire a lamp. And yet, you know, I, you know, it's electricity. So, oh my gosh, if I do it wrong, I might burn down my house. So mm -hmm. these lamps come into our repair cafes. They are, they are the parts are absolutely almost always interchangeable. We can always take a, a you know a, hmm. a socket from our box and and put it right in and it will work beautifully. It's very satisfying. I'm just like so excited by all the good things you guys said. I guess I'll I guess I'll kind of like give a nice shout out to basically all of textiles here. Like textiles has is really repairable. There's such a deep tradition and such a wealth of knowledge to draw on that's still happily really active all across society. There's such uh, creative repair in terms of textiles. Um, it, it's, it's, it's doable, it works, it's out there, and it really is kind of amazing. Uh, I, think, I mean, these are all I inspirational examples. All right, so my very final question for you is, I mean, we have three magnificent books here. They're all, they're all fantastic. I've, I've read all three, and they are, uh, I can happily recommend all three to everybody. But I am curious to hear from each of you, uh, if you could pick the type of person that you would like to read your book, who do you think it is most important? Uh, who, who out there in the world needs to hear your message the most? I think it is mostly... We hope that 
the people who find this book want to make their towns stronger, want to make their towns more resilient, want to um, discover within their towns people who have remarkable skills that they have been basically, you know, hiding their light under a bushel. Uh, and, you know, when you bring those people together and you see the way they bond and you see, you know, the way people come in and then leave, you know, so happy, <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff gets fixed. People leave very happy. And uh, it's, it is that, it's, it's a palpable strengthening of community. And anybody with an interest in that ought to, ought to latch on to this. So I guess fixation is written for a person who um, doesn't feel great about their patterns of consumption, but they don't quite know what to do about it. They might feel a little overwhelmed by their stuff or a little overwhelmed by the feeling that they're trashing the planet every time they <laughs> eat or buy something, um, but is not an expert, is not like deep into this. But I think hopefully they would buy the book and feel like, yeah, I can do this and I understand how this connects to some of those really big problems. I think that you wrote it in a really approachable way, uh, and and so absolutely, I'm 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 excited about that. Lee, Lee, how about you? Your your book is is a little bit higher level, and you're looking more more at systems and society. Who who do you think it's important to see the picture that you're painting? I think you know policymakers would be one group we'd like to hit, but I really you know going all the way back to when Andy and I started the Maintainers together. It's mostly like people who, whether in organizations or in daily life with their stuff, have been become frustrated with the way we talk about innovation um, and the way we focus on new shiny stuff and kind of like, you know, um, fail to give recognition to the people who keep our world going um, and fail to properly value maintenance and repair as a part of our culture. Um, and what we found is that there's lots of people who, and I'm sure you all know too, that there's just lots of people in our society right now who are waiting to hear that message. I think, you know, people read, you know, read our essays or hear a book, read our book or whatever, or, you know, see things like this. And they're just like, I've always felt something like this, but I've been waiting for someone to say it out loud. And I think that, that all three of our books kind of like touch on that. And so hopefully our, the people who need to hear it will find it. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've certainly enjoyed it. I want to do this again. Uh, what a wonderful group of people who have spent so much time uh, thinking about this issue very deeply and, and articulating it in these books. Um, uh, do uh, head your, head your, support your local bookstore and, and, and get a copy, and uh, hopefully we'll have more of these conversations on the iFixit channel uh, in the future.